Romans is the book we've been studying through. We're on week 22 of our study through Romans. We're in chapter 11. We're going to look at quite a bit of chapter 11 today. Romans is a great book with some of the most life-transforming passages you're going to see in the entire Bible. But it also wades into some really, really deep waters. And today we're going to get in the deepest point of the deep end. Uh, Tim Keller wrote about Romans chapter 11 that it is by far the most difficult passage of Scripture to understand. I heard a guy talking about his church, and he said they were working through the book of Romans, and they got to Romans chapter 11. The pastor stood up and said, look, I've been studying this passage all week. I'm really not sure what's going on here in Romans chapter 11. And since we've got Bible school and youth camp coming up, we're just going to spend time praying for that today. You know, that's one way to deal with it, I guess. But uh, Uh, Did any of you grow up in a church where a pastor would stand up and say, does anybody have a testimony today? Any of you grow up in a church like that? And that would just go on and on and on through the whole service until they took up so much time the pastor didn't have any time to preach. You know, I always thought that was just random. uh, But as I got older, I realized that the pastor did that when he didn't know what to say. Uh, So uh, I grew up in a church where we would take favorite hymn night. You know, when I was 14, 15, the youth group would meet on Sunday night. We'd all go out to pizza afterwards, but we would have church, and we would have a time where the, the song leader would just say, does anybody have a favorite hymn? And people would start calling out the numbers, the pianist play, and the congregation would sing. And, uh, uh, you know, we would do so much of that often that the preacher didn't preach. Uh, that would be the message. So if something goes wrong uh, in this message today, wherever you are, Nuno, be ready. Uh, so we might just start to sing. Uh, it, it, A question comes, if these passages are so hard to understand, why does Paul include it and why did God inspire it? I think to understand that, you need to know what has happened thus far in Romans. Paul's laying out this argument that everybody has a universal problem. We all are um, stuck with this sin nature that flowers into sinful actions that causes us problems in this life, but also separates us from a holy God. And no matter what man tries to do, they can't fix that problem on their own. The only solution uh, for our, our sin problem is Jesus sacrificing himself on the cross for us. Now, the Bible tells us that that sacrifice on our behalf is only applied to the believing heart. Paul makes the argument that it's through faith in Christ that a person will receive right standing with God. And the climax of Romans happens in chapter 8. Uh, where Paul reveals these great promises of God, that if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, there's no condemnation. You are right with God. There's no condemnation for those who believe in Christ Jesus. And even though this life will be tough, there is no comparison between this life and the glory that's going to be revealed for God's people. And and I know there are going to be times that we're confused about what's happening in our life. Someone dies, uh, a health issue, uh, a crisis occurs, evil exists, and we wonder what's going on, but we believe and we know that God is working all things for good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And no matter what happens, we know that we are still more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, that we will be overcome, or we will overcome because Christ lives in us, and nothing can change that. Paul, upon sharing these, immediately recognizes the question that his original audience is going to have. We don't have it. They did. And that is, but what about the Jews, Paul? You know, God made promises to the Jews. God promised the the people of Israel, national Israel, it seems, a lot of things. And they don't trust God's plan at all. They don't trust Jesus at all. What about them? Has God failed them? Has God let them down? So Paul starts interacting in Romans chapter 9 all the way to uh, chapter 11. And and he he deals with this question that he perceives his audience is going to have. And picking up in chapter 11 verse 1, he says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? And the answer is absolutely not. Of course he hasn't. Now for the next few verses, Paul begins a section explaining why God didn't fail the the people of of, of Israel. And the first thing he says is God didn't fail Israel because some of the Jewish people believed. And he says, I'm example A. Uh, 
continuing on in verse 1, he says, I'm an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I believe uh, all of the apostles were Jews, and God not only saved them, he used them to change the world. He says in verse 2, he, he says, God hasn't rejected his people whom he foreknew. Remember the argument he makes in chapter 9 that not every son of Abraham was Abraham's uh, uh, child. He says Ishmael, or what God considers the people of God. He says Ishmael was a physical descendant of Abraham, but only Isaac was the child of promise. Esau was a physical descendant of Isaac, but only Jacob was the child of, of promise. Jacob and Esau represented these two kinds of Israelites, those who know God and those who don't. And he, he makes the point, Paul does, in the book of Romans, that true Israelites, true people of God, aren't those who inherit Abraham's DNA, but they're those who embrace Abraham's faith. Since the very beginning, there have been people who've embraced Abraham's faith. Even in the moments where it seems like all have abandoned God. And that's where he picks up in verse 2. He says, don't you, know, don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. Ahab and Jezebel were so evil. And their prophets were so evil that, that Elijah prays that God would just slay the, the people of, of Israel. The ethnic Israel. Verse 3. He says, Lord, they've killed your prophets. They've torn down your altars. And you remember after he defeats the prophet of Baal, a prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, he says, I'm the only one left. And they're trying to take my life. Verse 4. But what was God's answer to him? I have 7,000 left for myself who've not bowed down to Baal. Verse 5. He says, in the same way, there is a remnant. There's always been a remnant. There's always been a people of God. You see, God has always preserved his chosen people throughout history. Even when it looks like everybody's turning away, there's still some. And notice, those uh, who are preserved are those who are chosen by grace. Those who've received the grace of God. God has not failed not only because there's some Jews who believe. God's not failed because his path was never about your DNA. His path was always about grace and faith. God didn't move the goalpost. No one has ever been made right with God because they kept the law. God has, has never made a person right with him because they showed more personal effort. That's true in the New Testament, and that was true in the Old Testament. The law was never given for man to create a self-reliant pathway to God. Even in the Old Testament, the people who were right with God were those who repented of the wrong, those who threw themselves on the mercy of God, those who trusted his character and not their own, and those were the people who were the covenantal people. Verse 6, he says, Now if by grace, then it's not of works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. God has always worked by showing people his compassion, his loving kindness, his mercy, his goodness, his patience. That is the way God has always worked. Verse 7. What then? Israel did not find what it was looking for? What about this? Israel, Israel was looking, but they didn't find it. And the reason that they didn't find it is they were looking for a path that was independent from God. But those who God showed grace to were the elect. They were the ones who found it. And he says, the rest were hardened. Now, don't see hardened as something God did against anybody's will. If you read the Bible, you see over and over, man chooses his sinful path, and if he is hardened, he's only going in the direction he wants to go. That's what we see in Paul's argument in Romans chapter 1. People don't want to acknowledge God. They don't see his beauty in creation. They don't uh, follow that internal guide that tells them what is right and wrong, and they choose their own path, and God says, okay, you go. That is the hardening process. They were hardened. He allowed them to continue down the path that they desired. Verse 8, he says, as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that can't see, ears that can't hear, even to this day. Verse 9, as David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a pitfall and a retribution to them. 
He says in verse 10, let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and their backs be bent continually. They couldn't see that they weren't able to please God. They couldn't see that only God could help them and their pride blinded them. And that leads me to a third point. Not only had God not failed them because some Jews were saved and God hadn't failed them because his path was always about grace, God hadn't failed them because their rejection was actually a part of God's plan. Everything in this universe that happens is leveraged for the glorious victory of our God. God is often working in ways that you can't imagine. Even when things are dark in your own life, even when things are upside down, even when people betray you, even when your health fails, even when evil seems to win every day in the news, even in those things, God is redeeming evil to bring good to his people. Here in Romans, God used the rebellion of Israel to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. It tells us in verse 11, by their transgression, the people of Israel, salvation has come to the Gentiles. You, you see this play out in Acts. When the apostles would go to a city, the first place they would go is to a synagogue, and they would preach the gospel to the Jews. And, and some people would believe, but honestly, most people didn't. And oftentimes, they would get kicked out of the synagogue, thrown into the streets and the marketplaces, and they would just keep preaching Jesus. And Gentiles would come to faith by the droves. By 100 years, uh, about 100 AD, about 70 years after Jesus Almost the only people who were believing were, were Gentiles. That's why when we read Romans, which is a mid-60s book, we see that the Gentile church is growing. The Jewish population of the church is starting to shrink, and people are starting to ask the question, what's going on with the Jewish people? What, 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 what's happening here? Well, God is allowing them to make space for the Gentiles. Some people believe that the Gentiles are plan B. They're like a consolation prize. They act like the Gentiles are the school that you apply to that you know that you can't get into if you don't get into the school you really want to. You know, th that's like when you talk to a University of Louisville student, they'll tell you, I really wanted to go to UK, but you know, I ended up. <laughs> but did God really want Jews and couldn't get them, so he just got stuck with the Gentiles? I mean, is that really what we're all about? We're kind of like a consolation prize, a rebound date. Is that it? Of course not. God, in his sovereignty, in his plan, chose to save the world through Abraham and Abraham's seed. Faith that Abraham brought to the table, translated into Jesus being born, who became the sacrifice for humanity, and Jesus' birth uh, 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 opened the door for all to be saved. And the scripture teaches us that even in Abraham's day, God said, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to the nations. Down in verse 25, he says, a partial hardening has come upon Israel. Notice it's a partial hardening, hardening, and we'll talk about that in a second. And it came upon them until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. But Paul anticipates somebody saying, is that it? Is that the fulfillment for the seed of Abraham for his line that they're just making room for the Gentiles? Is that it? And that brings us back to verse 11. He says, have they stumbled so as to fall? Are they gone? Absolutely not. Even God's work among the Gentiles has a purpose. Did you see it a minute ago? I didn't deal with it. Salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. You see that? This is not bad, sinful jealousy. Think of the prodigal son. Do y'all remember the story of the prodigal son? The man has two sons. One really rejects his dad and says, I just want money, and I want you to leave me alone, and I want to live my life. And so the father gives him the money. He goes off into the 
a foreign country and he wastes his life in prodigal living and he finds himself out of money and he's so poor and hungry that he ends up working to feed pigs, which is like the lowest of the low for a little Jewish boy. And, and he's so hungry that he's eating what the pigs are eating. And do you remember what happens to him while he's there in that foreign country? He comes to himself and he has a thought. Do you remember what his thought was? Even the slur servants and the slaves in my daddy's house have it better than I've got it. I think that's what he's talking about here. He looks at people who were brought in. They weren't even the sons, and they were brought in and treated with such uh, a dignity, and, and they were blessed in so many ways, and he says, they're better off than I am. Paul says, this is what's going to happen to the Jewish people. Even today, many Jews resent the claims that we make about the God of the Old Testament. We'd say that the God of Old Testament is our God. We say that the God of the Old Testament is our father. That, that we say the God of Jacob is our God. And they resent the closeness that we feel. I believe that what the Bible is teaching here is the Gentile love of the gospel will eventually cause Israel as a nation to turn back to God. And that brings me to this fourth point. The reason God hasn't failed Israel is because he's just not finished with their story yet. You know, we're living in a particular time. There have been generation after generation who has lived since Christ, uh, even more since the time of Abraham. God is just not done with their story yet. At some point in the future, Israel as a nation will come back to God. And, and the Bible says, if we go back to verse 25, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you'll, you won't be conceited. You, you, you know, you, yours wasn't the first ticket on the bus. A personal hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. But notice verse 26. He says, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. Now, this doesn't mean that every Jewish person will become a Christian. But there is coming a time where so many people are going to believe that it's going to look like a, a national conversion. It's going to look like God is doing something big in the nation of Israel. This, this will lead to a worldwide gospel Movement. Let's go back to verse 12. He says, now if their transgression brings riches for the world, they said no to Jesus. We get to say yes. Their failure brought riches to us. How much more will their fullness bring? God promised Israel would be a blessing to the nations, and they have been. Even their rejection of Christ gave us opportunity to know the gospel. So if their rejection has blessed the Gentiles, imagine what their embrace will bring about. Paul doesn't go into a lot of detail about how the Jewish return to Christ will lead a worldwide movement. The book of Revelation uh, talks about it, that in the latter days, what some call the tribulation, God will save 144,000 Jewish people. I don't think that that's a literal number. I think it's a figurative number. Uh, but he, he, even if it is a literal, there's a large percentage of Jewish people who are going to be saved, and he appoints them as worldwide witnesses, and, and they're successful in leading this, this substantial part of the population back to the gospel. Many scholars believe this is talking about the time that Israel will return, whatever it looks like, and I'm not dogmatic about that, whatever it looks like, this will happen because God will fulfill his promises to the Jews, just like he said. Verse 28, he says, regarding the gospel, they are enemies for your advantage, but regarding election, God has his hand on them, and they are loved because of the patriarchs. They are loved because he, of the faith that they had and the way that he spoke to them. In verse 29, he says, God's gracious gifts and calling are... Er er I said this right the first hour. You can't take them back. <laughs> They're irrevocable. His, his callings are, 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 are sure. Um, so the question that they had, has God failed to keep his promises to the Jews like he said? And the answer is not at all. Many Jewish people have been saved. Even the rejection has led to us being saved. And many Jewish people will be saved. And this should cause us to rejoice. Verse 13. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. Insofar as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. I'm excited about the ministry that I have to get to proclaim the gospel to the Gentile world because in some way God is going to use even this ministry to make the people of Israel jealous and some of them will be saved and God's plan will be culminated. 
verse 15. I love this. He says, if their rejection brings reconciliation to the world, can you even imagine what their acceptance will do? It'll be like life from death. It'll be like resurrection. There's going to be this miraculous thing that happens. If God has done this much through their, through their rejection, imagine what he'll do when they obey. Then in verse 16, he, there's an unusual phrase there. In verse 16, he says, Now, if the first fruits are holy, so is the whole batch. You can read 10 commentaries on this, and you're going to get at least eight different answers about what is the first fruit that he's talking about there. I personally believe it's referring to the first Christians, those who first heard the message of Christ and believed, who were all Jewish, who wrote the scripture, who the apostles were, 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 were uh, the ones who laid the foundation for the church, who, who taught that, that, that if you believe in Christ alone, through faith alone, you'll be right with God. And Jews and Gentiles, there's no distinction. We're people of God because of Christ who taught this. He says, if the first fruits were holy, everybody who lines up under their teaching, you're going to be holy too. You're going to be made right this way as well. Verse 17, Paul starts a warning. And he says, the Gentiles shouldn't be proud or grow apathetic in their salvation. In verse 17, he says, now if some of the branches were broken off and you, though a wild olive branch, were grafted in, you know, and, and you're sharing in this rich root of this cultivated olive tree. And I, I, he finishes his thought in the next verse, but let me just stop here for a second and say, I'm not a horticulturalist. I don't have a green thumb. When it comes to plants, I have no thumbs. I'm just not, I, I'm, it ain't my deal. I will lose out every time. Uh, in this. But what I understand, this grafting in, if you have a plant or a tree that has an unproductive branch, you can cut that branch off. And if the, if the, the vine or root or stem that is, is still filled with life is grafted to another plant or another vine or another limb and you tie them, bind them together, it will start growing and it has the potential to produce fruit. Here Paul uses this imagery and says some of the nation of Israel were broken off and Gentiles were grafted in. And they are sharing in the blessing of this rich fruit. And he says, but we don't have room for pride. Don't boast that you are better than other branches. Don't say we're so much better than the Jewish people. There's no room for pride on our part as Gentiles. We're not more deserving. We're not more loved than the nation of Israel. The only thing we can brag about is that we're grafted in. Now, it's interesting to me how much Romans 11 is like Isaiah 11. As we've been walking through Romans, it seems like we go back to Isaiah almost every week. When you look at Isaiah chapter 11, listen to these words. In verse 1, he says, A shoot will grow up from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And then it says in verse 2, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. A spirit of wisdom and understanding. A spirit of counsel and strength. A spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Does that sound like somebody to you? Out of the line of David came Jesus. The one who was, who was the true vine. And the one who if people are connected to him, they can bear fruit. These two complement each other. The root that sustains us is Jesus. We're in him, and this is why we're right with God. And that's why he says, in verse 18, at the end of it, he says, you don't sustain the root, guys, but the root sustains you. I hope everybody understands what that means. Our God is God, and Jesus is Lord. If no one in this room were to sing him praises, if no one in this country were to sing him praises, Jesus would still sit on his throne. If no one in this world gave him praises, the rocks would cry out, but it wouldn't matter. He would still be the Lord because the root is what sustains the branches, not vice versa. And the reason we are loved and are valued is because we are in the root. We're not holding Jesus up. We're not the key ingredient in the equation. It is true that branches were broken off so that we might be grafted in. 
And he tells us the reason they were broken off. In the very next verse, he says they were broken off because of unbelief. That's why they were broken off. And he says those of us who stay connected, we stay connected because we have faith. That's the only reason we stay connected to Christ is because we believe. But then he gives a warning in verse 20. He says, don't be arrogant, but beware. Verse 21, if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. I just want you to read that. I'm going to go back and just let you read it. That's us, Gentiles. Don't be arrogant. Beware. If God didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. If God was willing to cut off branches from the original tree because of unbelief, why would we ever think that we can get away with things that got them removed? They got removed because they took their position as God's chosen for granted. They had a name-only religion. They were Jewish, but they had no belief. They were circumcised in their physical body, but they weren't circumcised in their heart. Unfortunately, I think that's the case with many Christians today. If you ask them if they're saved, they'll probably say yes, and they'll tell you about a time when they joined the church or got baptized or raised their hand at VBS or got emotional at camp. They'll talk about their parents being Christians or they attend a Baptist church, but they don't live their lives as they believe that Jesus is Lord. And Paul says, wake up. If God didn't spare sons and daughters of Abraham, he won't spare you. I know if you're a good Baptist, you should be pushing back right now with almost everything you have in your heart and say, what about eternal security, pastor? I know about eternal security. I know about it well. The Bible teaches clearly that once you're saved, you're always saved. But I would say it also gives the caveat, only if you're really saved. If you're really saved, you're always saved. I believe in all my, with all my heart that if you're truly saved, you can never lose it. But that doesn't mean if you're religious, you're in. You know what walking an aisle proves? You can walk. That's what it proves. And an emotional moment at a tent revival or an emotional moment in a Sunday service or an emotional moment at any point in your life, you know what an emotional moment proves? You're a human being. And you have emotions. That's all it proves. The way that you know that you're in is you continue to have faith. The author of Hebrews says the way that you know that you're saved is if you maintain your confession of faith and follow to the end. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12, watch out brothers and sisters so that there won't be any, uh, be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Verse 13, he continues this. He says, encourage each other while it's still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception so that you don't keep going down that pride-filled path that says you're good enough and can do it on your own where God just says, okay, you have it your way. But he says in verse 14, for we have become participants in Christ. We, we trust in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the reality that we had in the start. Now, I want to make sure I translate what I just said for you. I'm not saying, are you living good enough? Mm, not at all. Works have never saved and works never will save. What I'm saying is, do you believe that your only hope is in Christ? What I'm saying is, do you believe that your only possibility of salvation is what he has done? What I'm saying is, if you, have you given up the hope that you can take care of yourself and you've fallen at the feet of the Lord and you're saying, I need you, Lord? Those who outgrow that must never had it. I walk in here so many Sundays knowing I don't deserve to be here. And in some ways, that I think is my best act of worship. Where I get to the place where I come in and say, God, I, I don't deserve the role. I don't deserve the seat. I don't deserve the name. I don't deserve the hope. But I have it because of Jesus. That's holding on to Jesus instead of holding on to yourself. That's what we're to hold on to. The evidence of faith is not the intensity of the motion at the beginning, but the endurance of the faith over time. J.D. Greer said it's like a marriage. You don't judge the sincerity of a marriage by how lavish the ceremony is on the night of your wedding. 
He judged the sincerity of a marriage by the faithful commitment over a lifetime. A lot of Christians are all ceremony and no commitment. And just like it would be in a marriage, that's a sham. Imagine on my wedding night. Man, we had this great ceremony and everything was just perfect. And it was just, you know, fantastic. They painted our car up. We did all the pictures, threw the bouquet, you know, did all that stuff. Then we got in the car and we went to the hotel. Kelly was unpacking her stuff, but I was packing mine back up. And she said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going home. She said, you're doing what? I said, yeah, I'm going home. How come? I got a date. Can you imagine? And yet that's what a lot of you have done. We confess Jesus is Lord and we walk out of this building and we say, I got a date. I'm going to live my life the way I want. I'm going to call the shots. I'm following my path. Falling at the feet of Jesus is saying, he is Lord, not me. You may be confused saying, are you saying that a person can start out saved and lose it? Absolutely not. I'm not saying that at all. The Bible clearly teaches that once you're saved, you're truly saved. There's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Whom he called, he justified. For many people, this sounds like two contradictory truths. Once God saves you, you'll always be saved. And if you endure to the end, then you'll be saved. That's not contradictory. It's complementary. One of the essential marks that Christ has changed your heart is, is endurance. A faith that endures. That doesn't mean it's perfect. Oh, my goodness. I've fallen, I've doubted, I've struggled. But yet the seed of the gospel still springs to life. And I trust Christ. If your faith endures to the end, that's evidence that you had salvation that you can never lose. If it doesn't, that's evidence that you may have never had it. My fear is some here may be surprised because they'll experience what Paul seems to be saying in Romans 11. Maybe it's because you think you're... He- that because of your heritage instead of your faith or because you said a prayer that apparently meant nothing in your life, that you're connected. Jesus said the ones connected to the vine are the ones that are connected. That's what Jesus taught. If God removes those branches from Israel that weren't connected and didn't submit to the lordship of Christ, How could we be so arrogant to think that that wouldn't happen to us? Verse 22. Therefore, consider both God's kindness and his severity. I mean, right? We thank you, Lord, for your salvation. And I recognize that you're so holy that you will hold people accountable. He's severe toward those who've fallen, but kind toward those who hold on to faith if we remain in his kindness. Otherwise, we too will be cut off. God says through this chapter and even in the next few verses that we're going to look at next week, God will graft back in all of national Israel who believe. But at this time, he's opening a door to us and we should respond to his kindness and not just play church games. My takeaways today. Number one, if you're here today and you've not put your trust in Christ, I beg you, I beg you, put your trust in Christ. I'm... You know, I believe everybody who puts their trust in Christ should be baptized, but I'm not talking about baptism. I'm talking about putting your trust in Christ. I believe that everybody who's a baptized believer should be a member of a church, but I'm not talking about membership. I'm talking about putting your trust in Christ. I believe that everybody who's a baptized member of a church should be serving and active and living a holy life, but I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about moving your trust from yourself and putting your trust in Christ. Number two, don't give up on lost people in your life. In chapters 9 through 11, Paul prays for the people of Israel and talks about the people of Israel repeatedly, even though he knows many of them are rejecting Christ. But he still has hope that God's going to save them. I don't know who the people of Israel are in your life, whether it's a wayward child or a best friend or a classmate or a teammate or a coworker or a neighbor or a spouse. Don't give up. Their story's not completed yet. Keep praying for them. And number three, realize that God is at work even when you don't see it. God is at work even, 
even when you don't see it. He's working in the Israelites' rejection, even now. They don't see it, but he is. He's going to continue to work. And then number four, ask God to help you be faithful. You see, I come in here every week, and uh, I feel like sometimes... I feel low and then sometimes I feel like how my Christian life is going is dependent upon me. Do y'all ever feel like that? Like how your Christian life is going is dependent upon you? You know the way for your Christian life to go incredibly well and you stay connected to the vine is get to the place where you're broken and you say, God, there's not a day, not an hour, not a minute that I don't need you, God. I need you, and I need your grace. That's what being faithful is. God, I need you. I pray that you'll be faithful. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share today. And God, I pray that it's been clear. I pray, Father, that you would use these words to uh, edify your body. I ask, God, that you will forgive us when we somehow confuse our worldly efforts with grace. God, I pray that you would convict hearts, Lord, who've done nothing but play religious games and not follow Jesus as Lord. I pray, Father God, that even today, Lord, you would convict hearts. And God, I pray that uh, you will help us to be burdened for those who don't know you. I pray for the salvation of Israel, God. Lord, I pray for their peace in the world, but I pray for their conviction in their heart. I pray that they would be unsettled until they find the peace that only comes through through Christ. God, I ask that you will... uh, Couldn't make it back this morning. Uh, And one is trying really hard to get back, but he's not going to make it, I don't think. But uh, uh, their names are uh, Brandon and Dylan. Did I get that right? Uh, and, and, and Ashlyn, and this is Russ and Angela, all who will love them as a part of our congregation and support them uh, in being a part of this congregation. Would you let them know by saying amen? Amen. amen. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for being here today. It is my prayer that uh, we will walk as people who, who put our faith and trust completely in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that does change how we live, but we never get over the fact that we need him as our Savior, and he is the one who sustains us. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, and be gracious to you, be warm and be filled, be gone.